Oh, hi. I'm ready for you this time. Let's talk about Justice League. Hello, welcome to Comic Tropes. I'm your host, Chris. This episode was requested by one of my Patreon members. L.S. Grieger asked me to take a look at the Justice League run by writers Keith Giffen and J.M. DeMatteis and art originally by Kevin McGuire. It is regarded as one of, if not the, best run on Justice League. And it's well remembered for its humor. But the reason it's well remembered for its humor is, first of all, that was different from everything else out on the stands, but it also had real stakes. It had real drama inherent in its stories. So the humor wasn't just simple gags and satire, it arose organically from the characters. That's what differentiated it. It is just very acclaimed, and it's what we're going to dig into the history of today to find out what makes it unique and why it's so special. The Justice League debuted in 1960 by writer Gardner Fox, and it was an update on DC Comics' 1940s team, the Justice Society. The Justice League began by featuring the heavy hitters, Superman, Batman, Wonder Woman, Flash, Aquaman, Green Lantern, and Martian Manhunter. But by the mid-1980s, it was full of unpopular third-string characters like Elongated Man, Vibe, Steel, Gypsy, and Vixen. DC Comics had been going through tough times throughout the 1970s on the marketplace. They'd been losing a lot of their readership to Marvel. And this culminated in June of 1978. The event has been referred to as the DC Implosion, and that's where they canceled about 40% of their titles. But Going into the 1980s, they were leaner, they were meaner, they started hiring a bunch of new talent, a lot of British talent, and their fortunes started to turn around. They decided in 1985 to reboot their entire line with the storyline Crisis on Infinite Earths. Now, coming out of that reboot, one of their big goals was to restart Justice League and do things differently. So, there was a miniseries first called Legends that teamed up a lot of different DC characters, and coming out of that, they were ready to start a new Justice League. This would be a Justice League that featured a lot of acquisitions that DC had made from other comics publishers in the past. Uh, they bought Captain Marvel from Fawcett Comics. They bought Blue Beetle from Charlton Comics. Now, after the Crisis on Infinite Earths reboot, those characters were all in the main DC continuity, and it was time to start Justice League anew. Behind the scenes, the first thing to decide on was who the creative team should be. Keep in mind, Justice League was not DC's top performing title at the time, so they were open to new ideas. Editor Andy Helfer specifically had been prompting artist Keith Giffen to write something. Giffen had broken in as an artist and had co-created characters like Rocket Raccoon and Lobo. He'd been given a co-plotter credit on his run on Legion of Superheroes, and Giffen was interested in writing Justice League, but felt he needed someone to script his plots. So Helfer turned to J.M. DeMatteis, known for his dark and introspective stories. DeMatteis and Giffen have spoken many times about how well they collaborated. Giffen would pitch tons of ideas, and Helfer and DeMatteis would take the best ones and refine the ones that were close. No one was precious about their work not being adjusted, and the two men co-wrote together in a very collaborative environment and got along so well, a certain amount of humor emerged. And that humor was pushed to the forefront thanks to relatively new artist Kevin McGuire's work. McGuire is noted for his deeply expressive characters, and the Justice League stories would give McGuire plenty of time to have characters provide subtle yet clear emotions. It helped sell the comedy. So now it was time to figure out which superheroes would comprise this new Justice League. And a big stumbling block was a lot of the top-level characters weren't available. Following the Crisis on Infinite Earths reboot, a lot of these characters were being worked on by top-level creators, and they just weren't available for a team book. You had John Byrne rebooting Superman with Man of Steel. You had George Perez on Wonder Woman. You had Mike Barron rebooting Flash with Wally West as the new Flash. These characters weren't available. Who was left? 
Batman editor Denny O'Neill took pity on the new Justice League team and let them use Batman for a while, who was going through more of a soft reboot and could fit into the team. Martian Manhunter was the other longtime League member available. To fill out the team, the writers added Green Lantern, but editor Andy Helfer told them to use Guy Gardner instead of Hal Jordan. Gardner had been introduced as a backup Green Lantern in the 60s, but he was bland and then brain damaged. But in the 1980s, writer Steve Englehart brought him back to comics and gave him an uber-macho, arrogant personality. It was a good character to use as a foil within a bunch of noble superheroes. Black Canary wasn't being used much and had a long history of being a Justice Society and Justice League member, so she was included as the main female lead. Captain Marvel was included, and the writers gave him a childlike personality to reflect that he was now portrayed as Billy Batson in a superhuman body, not a separate person that Billy Batson could turn into. DeMatteis and Giffen simultaneously worked on a Doctor Fate limited series, so they included that character since they could coordinate his use easily. Mr. Miracle hadn't been used regularly in about a decade, and Giffen was a big fan of Jack Kirby's New Gods material, so he included Mr. Miracle along with his manager Oberon and occasionally his wife Big Barda. Finally, DC asked them to include Blue Beetle, who had recently been acquired by Charlton Comics. Blue Beetle was a non-powered vigilante, in many ways somewhat similar to Batman. To differentiate him, the writers gave him a more light-hearted personality and pushed his technological genius. His airship, the Bug, frequently became the primary transport for the League. Shortly after the series began, the writers added Booster Gold, one of the first new superheroes created after the Crisis reboot, a jock who traveled back in time with his futuristic armor to become a superhero. Booster Gold and Blue Beetle became fast friends, creating a unique bond between two heroes who the book would have just as much fun following on dates and side jobs like a detective agency as going on adventures with the Justice League. The fact is, a lot of the humor emanated from the antics of Booster Gold and Blue Beetle. Now, Keith Giffen had been writing Ambush Bug, and that was an absurd title with a lot of humor. But J.M. DeMatteis was known for much more somber stories, like uh, Moonshadow, the first graphic novel that was fully painted, or the Doctor Strange graphic novel Into Shambhala. So somehow, this combination of these two writers together ended up giving us an interesting mix of humor and real drama and that humor would undercut the drama and be that much more powerful. The humor wasn't too silly, but there's probably several reasons why it stands out to people. First, as previously mentioned, the artwork by Kevin McGuire was well suited to humor. He had strong storytelling skills with pages having clear establishing shots, different body types that were easy to identify, and convincingly expressive faces. This was on full display in his iconic cover for issue one, featuring the team glaring up at the reader and Guy Gardner quipping. That was later given multiple homages by Kevin McGuire whenever the roster for the team went through a big change. Another strength was that the title had many personality types to give us comedy. Martian Manhunter was stoic and serious, so his occasional dry sense of humor was always a nice surprise. Batman and later Martian Manhunter's extremely serious leadership naturally clashed with Guy Gardner's brash, disrespectful personality. It resulted in the classic page where Guy challenges Batman and is taken out with a single punch. There's also natural foils within the team. Guy Gardner is annoying, and the wealthy Maxwell Lord manipulates the Justice League to his own ends. That natural conflict lends itself well to a simple quip undercutting the serious nature of a character. Finally, the humor didn't need to do much to stand out from what else was on the shelves. This was a point in time where DC was putting out very serious books like Watchmen and The Dark Knight Returns. It was a period of grim and gritty. Uh, popular characters were vigilantes like Wild Dog and Vigilante. Speaking of differences, one big one was that the title wasn't called Justice League of America anymore. Giffen and DeMatteis wanted the book to have big global stakes. It started for its first six issues as Justice League, and by issue seven was retitled Justice League International. 
It featured worldwide threats for the league, and the title reflected that. The team was now sanctioned by the United Nations and headquartered in embassies around the world. Batman and Captain Marvel step down, and Martian Manhunter takes the leadership role. It's later revealed that the formation of the League is due to the actions of Maxwell Lord, a new character created by Giffen, DeMatteis, and McGuire. Maxwell Lord is used across their five-year run as a man manipulating the team into existence and working behind the scenes to operate as an international unit. Lord is a powerful businessman who invites characters like Dr. Light and Booster Gold to join the team. He steps in directly in an early story to smooth over relations between Russia and America after the League tries to stop a Russian nuclear reactor meltdown. It leads to Dr. Light leaving by the third issue and Booster Gold joining. Russia soon asks for one of its superheroes, Rocket Red No. 7, to join. Captain Adam also joins this story while Dr. Fate leaves. Lord is a complex character, shown to constantly be fighting his natural instincts to manipulate and his growing conscience as he's frequently surrounded by noble people. Lord himself is being manipulated by a computer created by new god Metron with a consciousness that calls itself Kilgore. The goal is to create a weakened league that would be vulnerable to alien invasion. Later, Lord finally rebels and destroys the computer system, and stays around as a type of manager for the League. Later, writers turned Lord into a much more overt supervillain, but his early years were much more nuanced. It's the nature of any team superhero book to occasionally vary up the membership, and Giffen and DeMatteis used their new characters to help explain that. Lord had used the opportunity of the previous League drifting apart to create his new version. He came to believe the League was needed, and refused to let them drift apart again, creating semi-regular membership drives to add new characters. At a certain point, Mr. Miracle had been kidnapped by aliens, and Rocket Red and Martian Manhunter left to save him. Black Canary resigned. Behind the scenes, she was being used in the serious Green Arrow series, The Longbow Hunters. So Maxwell Lord had a recruitment drive that added female heroes Fire and Ice, who would go on to become long-standing members of the League. Lobo was also temporarily added, a favorite of writer Keith Geffen, who had co-created the character. Enemies the League faced included heavy hitters like Despero, the New Gods, Queen Bee, and more. There was a massive alien invasion, which resulted in a gene bomb going off that gave people superpowers, and that included Maxwell Lord, who gained telepathy. At the risk of recapping their adventures, I'll just cut to the chase and say the team faced a number of high-stakes threats. And that is what made following these characters in their downtime that much more interesting. Ultimately, the biggest accomplishment by Giffen and DeMatteis was that we started to really care about these characters and their lives. We cared about their losses, their injuries, their accomplishments, and their defeats. Following the title isn't difficult. It starts with Justice League number one, changes to Justice League International, and then to Justice League of America. But the writers stay together for a five-year, 60-issue run, plus some spin-offs and annuals. Kevin McGuire eventually stepped down, and his replacements included Ty Templeton and Adam Hughes in his first and likely only ongoing monthly title. The book was a unique blend of high adventure and mundane, sitcom-esque explorations of the characters' lives. Highlights included character arcs like Maxwell Lord trying to be a better person, and Guy Gardner's tough guy facade receding when he started a relationship with team member Ice. There was real heartbreak when Blue Beetle felt betrayed and abandoned at the point Booster Gold quit the team. Another highlight was Mr. Miracle's supposed death. We, the readers, knew that it was a robot duplicate, but his teammates didn't know that, and when it was destroyed, we felt their pain. The book was produced in the mid-1980s through the early 1990s, and it is a product of its times. I don't think the stories themselves are dated at all. I think that they're very readable today, but the context, the environment that it's taking place in, definitely reflects what was on America's mind at the time. Uh, you had Black Canary as a strong-willed feminist. You had Guy Gardner constantly referring to himself as Rambo. Uh, you had Mr. Miracle and Big Barda uh, living a home life in suburbia. 
and they had come from another planet. So it sort of told us a little bit about the immigrant experience, and it also sort of showed how the idea of 1950s suburbia was definitely eroding by the 1980s. You had Maxwell Lord as a materialistic businessman. And then you had lots of stories where the frosty relationship between the United States and Russia was undercutting whatever was going on at the time. The run by Giffen and DeMatteis is an iconic run, one of the best for any team book. It belongs up there with the Lee and Kirby Fantastic Four run, the Claremont and Byrne X-Men years, and the Teen Titans issues by Marv Wolfman and George Perez. They elevated characters like Blue Beetle, Booster Gold, Guy Gardner, and Martian Manhunter. They delivered a book that featured both action and humor that actually worked. And they gave us the iconic laugh, Bwa-ha-ha. -ha. Yeah, that's a pretty unique laugh. You know, at this point, I guess I've shared all my key thoughts on the Justice League run, but I really want to see if I can master that laugh. So let's go to WikiHow, and I'll see if I can change my laugh from ha-ha-ha -ha -ha to a convincing Bwa-ha-ha. -ha. Okay, let's see here. Okay. It says, I pick a laugh I want, and I practice. Some really good advice. Let's try. <laughs> yep, nailed it. Thank you, WikiHow. All right, let's see what kind of fan art I got this week. All right, we have this piece by Amanda Stewart. That's her Instagram right there. And this is fantastic. Wish I had caught it just before our Halloween episodes ended, but it is glorious. Beautiful, beautiful artwork. I've got this interesting piece by San Yasco, and there's his Instagram and also his Tumblr. Beautiful artwork. Uh, it looks like San Yasco might be from Russia, I'm not quite sure. Here's a viewer that's definitely international. We've got this beautiful piece by Joe Sanchez, who greets me from Venezuela. I love it, Joe. Thank you. This is a pretty cool piece by Yancey Reed, owner of Zion Comics. There's the link to his site there, and I guess uh, Zion Comics does all sorts of self-published uh, superhero type stories. We've got Keith Stoll making a return. Keith, always love your pieces. I would love to see Infotron go up against Godzilla. We've got this beautiful piece by Maciek making a return, and if I'm not mistaken, I believe you are from Poland? And so that means I've got quite the international representation this week. I love it. Finally, I've got this beautiful piece by Kira James, who comes from England. Kira provides two of her websites and her Instagram account, where you can see more of her artwork and work. All right, so Maciek and Keith have won in the past, so uh, they're not being entered in this week's weekly Gotchapon prize drawing. Also, Kira James said that she didn't need to uh, be entered into that, that she just wanted to submit her art, so that's fair. That means I've got four numbers here. I'm going to drop them in a bag, drop them in the, uh, the old Gotchapon prize bag. If you would like to see your artwork featured on this show and be entered for a chance to win a Gotchapon prize, just email it to this address. Make sure that it's related to the show in some way. And if you want me to include a social media or website link, be sure to include that in the email as well. All right, so reaching in the bag, I've got a number here. It is number four. Number four. Who's number four? Here's something new. Thank you to a generous donation by Lunarshine. I now have a Gotchapon machine. Lunarshine uh, has a website. You can see that right here. This is so exciting. We're going to actually get to uh, use a Gotchapon machine to see what people win each week. This is a working Gotchapon machine. I love it. Uh, I need to get a stand, obviously. I don't have a stand yet, but I'll get one. All right, and Yancey Reed, your prize is, I think it's some sort of a baseball game that you assemble. I know you can't see that too well, but thank you again for the Gotcha Pony Machine by Lunar Shines. That's so exciting to have this. I'll get a stand so that we can uh, see that regularly. Ah, whew. This was a very fun episode to create, so thank you to my Patreon member, uh, L.S. Grieger. Great suggestion. 
glad I finally got to cover a very iconic run. Uh, let's see. News. News about the show. Um, I finished uh, a very successful uh, Inktober. I live streamed every single day successfully. It was exhausting, but thanks so much to all of you who came and joined the chat room and honestly, like, very generous super chat donations. Too many to list, but thank you. You know who you are. Very much appreciated. Uh, definitely not something I'm going out there asking for, but uh, it was wonderful to receive them. Very, very nice. I promise I will keep live streaming whenever I am able. Uh, a reminder, I've got a contest going on. You can win this very unique, completely unused roll of toilet paper that Marvel Comics produced that has a comic book on it, an original comic book. You can only get it on this piece of toilet paper. All you have to do is send me the weirdest or worst comic that you can find. So if you find one, just shoot it to this address and uh, who knows, you might win not only this prize, but of course I will review the worst comic that I receive. I already received some entries, would love to receive some more. That goes through the end of the year and in early 2019, I'll reveal who won and do a review. All right, that's plenty to talk about. Thank you all for being here. Hey, until next week when I have another new episode, I want you out there to keep reading comics. Take care. Bye.